KPOG 102.9 FM, Grimes. All right, good morning. It is 10 o'clock, and this is KPOG Grimes, West Des Moines, and all over the world on the international super speed Google web internet. Tell I'm just old, I don't even know what to call it. I call it the Google. It's webcast1live.com. And if you ever want to see or watch or hear, be quiet. The moment. Uh, Alexa, I didn't ask for you to say anything. Good heavens. Um, if you ever want to hear any of these programs or watch any of these programs, you can get them all at YouTube at webcast, that's one word, W-E-B-C-A-S-T, webcast1, O-N-E, live.com. And this is just technical jargon. Uh, I wouldn't know this if I wasn't in the business, but technically a podcast is audio only, and a webcast is audio and visual. And so what we offer here is the uh, audio and the visual. So welcome to the Wednesday edition. My, my, my. Got a lot to talk about today. The main point of my conversation today with you is why witness? Why go out and tell people about Jesus why walk across the street and tell your new neighbor about Jesus why not stop at high V today and see somebody that's all fretted and worried out and stressed and just say you know can I just can I just pray with you for a minute would that be all right with you I want to pray for you And what would you say? Because you don't have a relationship with them. You don't really know, and you're probably not going to get a life story out of them while you're standing there in an aisle with every smile. Or a smile in every aisle. Right, okay. (laughs) That's what we're going to talk about today. And it's kind of in the midst of all this stuff going on. Man, I, I, I sat there last night in my house. Second day, no power. Uh, no Wi-Fi, uh, so I can't even use my phone beyond phone and texting because I the data just goes through the roof. Who can afford that? It's like fifteen bucks a gig, and a, and a half you can use a gig in seven eight hours. And as I've told you before, when I sleep, I listen to sermons. I've got them on autoplay, and I just listen to different pastors and different sermons and. And I sleep with one of those masks. And I haven't had either for two nights. Forget the fact I don't have any TV or it's a little warm inside. I, you know. So I woke up this morning and I was kind of feeling like Job. Why me, Lord? What have I ever done? To deserve even one of the blessings I know. We're going to talk about that. All right, 12th day of August, Jesus calling. Come to me when you are weak and weary. Rest snugly in my everlasting arms. See, I do not desire your weakness, my child. Or, I'm sorry, I do not despise your weakness, my child. Actually, it draws me closer to you because weakness stirs up my compassion, my yearning to help. Accept yourself in my weariness, knowing that I understand how difficult your journey has been. Do not compare yourself with others who seem to skip along their life paths with ease. Their journeys have been different from yours, and I have gifted them with abundant energy. I have gifted you with the same, providing opportunities for your spirit to blossom in my presence. I love that word, blossom. Isn't that a great word? And you can say it. You can say it like you're watching a flower blossom. You can say, 
Blossom. Blossom. I have gifted you so you can be provided opportunities for your spirit to blossom in my presence. Accept this gift as a sacred treasure, delicate yet glowing with brilliant light. Rather than struggling to disguise or deny your weakness, allow me to bless you richly through it. Father, your words through me today help uh, help your message to be transmitted, to be shared, to be forwarded. Not from my soul, not from my mind, but from yours, through me. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So who uh, Wednesday, or I'm sorry, Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, who, who woke up and felt like Job? Good Lord. What are you doing to me? You know, kids aren't in school. We don't know whether they're going to go. This may not be a big deal to some of you, but it, it's a big deal to a lot of people. College football is probably going to be canceled, not just the Big Ten. And it's not, I, I'm not so concerned as a, as a viewer because I'm not a big football person. I mean, I try to watch all the games from where I went to school. And, and, you know, sometimes I'll watch a big rivalry, but I, I'm not a big sports guy, never have been. But I do know the economics of college football. And it doesn't matter whether you have an 0-16 season or a 16-0. and There's money generated from football that supports volleyball, supports basketball, supports wrestling. They're not going to be able to wrestle this year. Are you kidding me? I mean, if you can't go on the the um, if you can't go on the football field and hit each other, how are you going to get all sweaty? I mean, well, they're not going to do it. And the economics is going to hurt bad, bad. What does it all mean? <laughs> one of my favorite weather people is Jerry Ann Ritter. And the reason I like to watch Jerry Ann Ritter is I think she's transparent. I don't think there's hardly anybody else on TV who's better. And there's a lot of people that are as good. So she, I'm not holding her above anybody else. But Jerry Ann seems to feel it. You know, when you, when, you, when, you, when you listen to her give the forecast and she said, man, it's going to feel like 102 today. She says it like I feel it. Oh, my gosh, it's going to be 102. Are you? Oh, gee, man, that just ruined my day. just sapped the energy out of me. Jerry Ann said yesterday that what we, what we saw, what we witnessed on Monday was almost a once-in-a-lifetime event for Iowa. Hurricane force winds. Now, what is a hurricane force wind? What's the difference between a hurricane force wind and a tornado force wind? It's easy. Tornadoes turn and turn and turn and turn. And so the air is just constantly turning. And things are getting sucked up into the air. Hurricane is just straight line. Just boom. And it's got this big front. I want you to think about the biggest bladed snow plow you could imagine. Bigger than bigger than bigger than bigger. And behind it is this mighty wind. And it's just pushing forward. It's not turning. It's not slowing down. And it just comes right above, right above the ground, right through the trees. Takes the top of the trees off. You know, Clive and other suburbs in the western part of our community adopted many years ago something that wasn't available when we built Des Moines, underground power lines. Very rarely do some of those areas have power issues, except since Monday. The other thing, I don't know if you know about this thing, 
it went 700 miles and it really didn't change directions oh the jet stream pulled it up a little bit as it as it came out of Colorado and Kansas so it went right through the middle of Iowa and then it turned down a little bit as it went to Ohio but unbelievable now depending on what your theology is and if if you believe that there is a right or wrong here I am I'm more than happy to listen to what you have to say I really am but I believe that everything happens for a reason and if it's not created by God then God comes in and deals with it as he believes he should I don't think for one moment I think it is a hundred percent no that God had anything to do with the creation of this pandemic 100%. This was man made and it was spread by man. And I also believe that if God has nothing to do with it, guess who's leading the parade for the other side? Yeah, Spirit of Jezebel, Devil, Satan, Lucifer. And see, the devil, Lucifer, evil, anything that's not God I don't care what word you use I'm, I'm not into label either it's God or it's not it's either love or it's not and I don't think a pandemic that was created in a laboratory experimenting on animals that were then taken to a, a, a meat market, a food market, and sold and then butchered and eaten. I just don't think God has anything to do with that. I don't know why he would. Nothing good about it. Say good morning to Gail and Carolyn and Brad. Brad says, why isn't it created by God? And then he says... Well, that is pretty sure, but God will use it to his glory. Yes, I agree. I don't believe confusion is created by God. I don't think hate was created by God. I don't think envy, jealousy, guilt, and shame were created by God. I believe, I believe, and it's okay if you disagree with me. It would be a fun conversation driving down the road one day or a fun conversation over a cup of coffee or a nice big steak that you're going to buy me out at the Rube Steakhouse. Whatever, whatever you choose, it's okay. But God created you and I to be perfect. And see, in God's eyes, it wasn't perfect. It was just the only way there was. Before us... The only rebellion that God ever felt was, I don't know, maybe he didn't feel any. And then one day, Lucifer, that was his name, that is his name, got jealous of his brother named Jesus. Because God favored Jesus. He favored that soul that he created. Because that soul was his. And it wasn't jealous. And it wasn't shameful. And it didn't pass guilt and make people feel bad. And one day, Satan says, I'm going to be God. I'm going to throw a rebellion. You and I are watching the biggest coup in the history of the world. You thought the United States separated from England and France was a coup? <laughs> the biggest coup of all was when the devil tried to take over heaven. 
had an army of angels, betrayers, abandoners. And he looked at Jesus and said, I not only want to defeat Jesus, I want to be like God. And everything that Jesus does that's good, the devil makes bad. I really believe that. To every yin, there's a yang. To every right, there's a left. To every front, there's a back. And if I read my Bible correctly, if I, if I listen to the right people on theology, you know, if, if, if and I'm going to make a, a kind of a joke here, but if Jesus made a waterproof sneaker, the devil would try to change water to acid that eats through the sneaker. He is the most jealous, the most blaming, blameful, blameful person, entity, not a person, entity, spirit, that we'll ever, 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 ever know. And as Paul says in Romans, and I don't have the exact quote, but we don't, we don't, we don't fight principalities, flesh, or government. That's not who we fight. Oh, the devil likes to say, Squirrel! Shiny thing over here. Shiny thing over here. See it? Shiny thing over here. So we, we take our eyes off love. We take our eyes off grace. We take our eyes off forgiveness. We take our eyes off caring for widows and orphans. We take our eyes off the most important thing in the world, which is one verse in the Bible. Matthew 28. No, it's not John 3.16. Go therefore and disciple all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28.19. You want to know what your mission in life is? You're frustrated because God won't somehow reveal to you what you think his purpose should be in your life and every time he shows you one you say I'm, 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 I'm. I, I don't want to do that I want to do this well, God said okay go ahead but you know you're kind of on your own I wouldn't want to do it without God would you if you want to know what you're here for just read that verse right there Matthew 28 19 you know the Lord Jesus died on the cross to accomplish redemption and then victoriously resurrected from the dead Right after that, he told his disciples, go, go out into the world and make disciples of all men and women, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I, I don't think the Lord just suggested or recommended that to you and me. He commanded us to do it. I, I, I am greatly humbled unbelievably humbled that he decided to commission this boy from Beatrice, Nebraska. Humble beginnings, little overweight, has a face for radio, made more mistakes than a bad Ouija board. But he called me to go out and preach about him. To spread the news about him. And to who? It's real easy. You don't have to think about who you're preaching to. He said, go out and preach to all the people. All lives matter to God. He wants every one of his children home in heaven. And there's only one thing stopping us. From all being one big happy family and the attendance is 100%. And that's the jealousy and the evil of the spirit of Jezebel. Who tears families apart. Tears marriages apart. Whom God has put together to let no man tear apart. do us part. 
And that's just like a big flashing green light for the devil. Oh good, another marriage I get to mess up. Another family I get to destroy. Another place to put church hurt. Lies, deception. A pandemic. Social unrest. A hurricane. Now, I, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm. I'm. I am not a person who tries to read Daniel or Revelation and say, "Oh, see, right there, right there. Well, that's it, right there. That's it. See, we're we're at the end. We're coming to the end. See, right there. God's in charge. What does it matter if I notice it or not? Oh, I know Revelation. I read the signs. I share it with people. We've talked about it here. You and I many times. We'll do it again and again. I said the other day, if you really want to study Revelation, I'll come help. I didn't like that book in the beginning. I didn't like it at all. And you know why? Two things. I didn't understand it. And therefore, I was afraid of it. Because what we don't understand, we're usually afraid of. Want to get a group of people together and study Revelation? I'll, I'll do it with you. I don't teach. I don't lead. Jesus leads and the Holy Spirit teaches. I just facilitate. And it will take us months. If we met for an hour once a week, it would take us 60 months, 50 months, 40 months. Maybe we could get it done in 24 to 36. But to really study a book like Revelation, to really study a book like Acts, or Romans, or even John, sometimes you just got to stop and go, this word, what's this word mean? What is the Greek in this word? I'm studying for Sabbath study this week and I'm facilitating two of the studies and we're talking about witnessing and why it's so important do you know what the Greek word is I'm sorry back up Do you know what one of the definitions in Greek for the word witness is this blew me away when I heard it martyr Martyr. When you are a martyr or when you have been martyred or when you're perceived to be a martyr, you are a witness. Isn't that crazy? Think about it. You know, Jesus doesn't call from the peak, from the throne, from the pulpit. He doesn't call the rich, the famous. He digs down into the depths of the pit and says, you. Me? Yeah, you. You fisherman. You tax collector. You prostitute. You sinner of all sinners. You alcoholic. You drug addict. You divorced two, three times over. You the one with the potty mouth. You, the one with all the tattoos. You, you, you the one that is church hurt and doesn't for any reason think you're a good enough Christian to be called by God. I dare you to dare him. I'll double dog dare you. I'll even triple dog dare you. Because he'll come for you. I know. He calls from the pit, not the pulpit. He calls you to go out into the world and make disciples of all men and women and then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're going to shy away from this a little bit when I tell you this, but do you know that you have the same power, spirit, relationship, 
gift to baptize somebody that John the Baptist had. You could take somebody out in the Raccoon River, Gray's Lake, your bathtub, a sprinkler for all I care, uh, uh, a glass of ice water from Mickey D's. Because when you baptize, you baptize in the name of. It's not in the name of Mac or Brad or Carolyn or Gail. You baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So go out and make a disciple. Change the world. We're sitting here with a pandemic. We're sitting here with social unrest. We're sitting here with weather that just blows us away. I don't know about you, but it blows me away. I sat here in this chair at a quarter of ten on Monday morning. And watched from my windows in the studio the sky get so dark. There was no moon. There was no stars. There was no light at all. And two hours later, as it passed through our community, we had trees down. We had houses burned up. We had cornfields flattened. You want, you want to talk about the worst part of that storm on Monday? It isn't that Max still doesn't have power at home. It isn't that High V just got opened up in some places today because they couldn't get the power back. It isn't for the, the roof coming off the, the Buccaneers barn or the, 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 the two by fours that came horizontal through a wall. Or two, or three, or four in Perry. Missed one guy by inches. Here's the amazing thing about that storm. The death toll. You know what it stands at right now? So we're, we're 48 hours, right? Monday to Tuesday, Tuesday. We're 48 hours after that. Blinding rain. Winds that toppled power lines that were alive and sparking and trees that came down on cars and houses. Did you see that report on Channel 8 of the guy that bear, uh, in Marshalltown on Highway, uh, Lincoln Highway, Lincoln Way. He barely got out of his maroon car until this tree came down and flattened it. If the guy had not been if he had not gotten out of that vehicle, the moment that he did, you know what the death toll is on this storm? 700 miles, 115 mile an hour winds. You know what it is right here in Iowa? Zero. You may spell it. N O T H I N G. Z E R O. I know my friends who are college football fanatics. I'll tell you one guy that's just madder than heck. That's Keith Murphy. <laughs> okay, I mean, first baseball's canceled. And then. Well, first basketball's canceled. No, 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 no NBA championships. Then baseball wiped off the map. Now remember, Murphy's a sports freak. He lives, eats, drinks, and breathes sports. It's not just what he does for a living. It, 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 it's, it's a passion within him. And now they called college football. I don't even know if the pros are going to be able to play. You want to talk about somebody that's mad in a hornet's nest. I wouldn't want to be a hornet right now and live in T Keith Murphy's backyard because he'll come kick your butt. He's mad. You're mad because you might have to quit your job because you got to stay home with the kids. You're mad because your wife can't go to work. Your husband can't go to work. they got to stay home and work. And you're trying to run a household. You're trying to homeschool the kids, and you're not a teacher. Good Lord. Mac, I want you to homeschool your kids. Yeah, right. 
Uh huh. Yeah. That ain't gonna happen. But I would if I had to. And right now, some moms and dads have to. We were talking a little bit about all the bad things that are happening, and I said they're not of God, and Brad commented online saying, you are right. No, actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, Brad said, or Carolyn is saying to Brad Sand, you're right, not all those things. All those things, they're not, they're not of God. They are the absence of God. All those things were created by our sinful nature. Don't blame God for the pandemic. It wasn't him. Don't blame God for the riots, and the looting, and the fear that you may live in walking down your street. Don't blame God for the football season getting over with. The devil would like you to blame God for all those. He would like to whisper in your ear, hey, your God, he sucks. Look at what he's doing to you, man. He's making everybody sick. People are dropping dead. They have to wear masks. The kids can't go to school. Protesters are out. They're looting. They're burning. Cancel football. Kids don't go back to school. That's a good God, Satan says. That's the God you want to worship? And when I hear somebody blame that on God, I just want to yell. I want to scream. I want to raise my voice. Don't you get it? Those things are not of God. None of those things are of God. Every one of that has confusion, sickness, death, greed, power. God doesn't teach us to have any of those or want any of those things. Commandment number 10, thou shalt not covet. Don't covet somebody else's house, their power, their car, their wife, their husband, their children, their perfect kids. Don't do it. That's not of God. God gives you what you are supposed to have. If you walk with him, and you're filthy rich, good job. If you're hardly making rent, and the kids are going without, but you do the best possible job you can at your job, and you love Jesus more than you hate being broke, good job. I can't explain it, but God is blessing you. Before Jesus mugged me, I wouldn't have called those blessings. I'd call those consequences, not being good enough. But God doesn't care how much dinero you have, or how big a house you live in, or what kind of car you drive. When those things fall apart and you don't have what you need, you can't blame God, because he didn't do it. Blame who isn't God. Blame the ones who don't follow Jesus. Blame the ones that are not driven by the Holy Spirit and the goodness of them, but yet they're driven by evil. People who want to hurt you, harm you, make you feel guilty and make you feel shamed. Shake your fist at somebody. Shake your fist at them. By the way, just while I'm thinking about it, you got a power company truck sitting outside your house. Take them a bottle of water. Take them a cup of coffee. Take them a homemade cake. Take them a bag of M&Ms, Doritos, my favorite, Cheezos. Or at least just thank them. You know, I can, I can honestly tell you that whenever I see someone in a military uniform, or a police uniform, or a fire uniform, or an EMT uniform, or a doctor, or a nurse, or a teacher. 
I, I, I'd like to say I always, but always is a bad word. So I almost always thank them for serving. And I've heard from some of them how much it means. That whole malarkey at Dunkin' Donuts the other day with Officer Paul. I, I don't even want to say anymore because what's coming out of my what what's coming through my mind that I won't let come out of my mouth is a real earthly scolding for those two young brats. Those empowered, entitled evil people who made Paul, an officer of the law, feel that way. Don't you think they're under enough pressure? Don't you think the job's not tough enough to have some yoko, yabba dabba doer, some jackrabbit wearing a Dunkin' Donuts cap saying, I'm sorry, we're not going to serve you because you're a police officer. I got to stop right here because I'm going to get in trouble. 1036, 24 before the top, 12th day of August in the Lord's year 2020. Look at that. They're all even numbers. 1036, 8, 12, 2020. Hmm. What do you think, Cat in the Hat? Think those numbers are something we ought to pay attention to? He's a numbers guy. So what are we supposed to do as Christians in the midst of what just seems like a never-ending barrage of stuff that isn't of God? I, I, I think we've taken the last 20, 30 minutes and figured out that we don't blame him. Are we all? Can we all raise our hands and say we're on the same page there? Okay, good. My hand's up. Your hand up. Picasso, your paw up. For those of you who uh, aren't watching on Facebook or YouTube, there's no reason to have two cameras in this studio unless we have a guest. But we have two cameras. So lately I've been bringing Picasso, and he loves to sit on a chair and get all curled up. And if you're looking at him right now, you can see his eyes are open. Picasso. See, he's looking at me. He doesn't move his tail. He doesn't, it just his ears and his eyes. Daddy loves you. Jesus loves you too, Picasso. So what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to stand out and and take water to the people that are working to try to get our power back on? Absolutely. Are we supposed to thank those people that are essential and are putting in, they're risking life, treasure, time, family time, marital time, so they can work an extra shift at the hospital, so they can be in that ambulance when it's called out, so they can climb that pole to get that wire hooked up so we can have air conditioning again, so we can watch the boob tube again. Yeah, maybe so. Are we supposed to thank people who are essential, who get treated like garbage from... Never mind, I can't go down that road again. Yes, you are. You're supposed to thank them. I'm not going to enter into the mask controversy because it's political. I will tell you that I wear a mask. If I'm standing in a room and there's ten people, and I'm one of them, and five or four of them have masks on and the other five don't, I'm wearing my mask for all nine of them. Out of respect for those that think that feel, maybe know, that a mask makes a difference. I don't know whether it does or not. I'm so tired of all the reports, but you know what? I'm going to wear it. I'm going to wear it out of respect. It's, it's like holding the door open for someone, not just a woman, not just an elderly person. Hold it open for the kids. Hold it open for the delivery guy that's got four boxes he's trying to carry. Let's be nice. Let's say nice things. Let's be kind. Can't we go a little extra farther? I I know it's easier to be mean. You do understand that, don't you? Because of our sinful nature, it is easier to be mean. You just witnessed that out of me just minutes ago. 
I get talking about these kids that treat police like that at a, at a donut shop here in town. Bad words roll through my mind. Bad words. Name calling. Real crappy thoughts. Evil. Excuse me. Evil thoughts. Something that I don't think even Jesus would say. Although he did call the Pharisees a brood of vipers. Not a very nice thing to say back then. Brood of vipers. It comes from our sinful nature. It's much easier to look at somebody and go, Bleh. you're a jerk. You're fat. You got a face for radio. You drink too much. You cuss too much. That, that, that takes nothing but to draw within the worst part of us to hurt somebody and put them down. But to say thank you for serving. Thanks for being a teacher. Thanks for spending your time in a retirement home. Taking care of people that can no longer take care of themselves. Maybe, maybe someone that I should be taking care of and I just don't have time or quite frankly I don't want to. I don't know your situation. I don't know anybody's but mine. And I cert on a scale of, you know, one to ten, I'm I'm somewhere probably around a Six, when it comes to helping people that need to be helped, I could do better. I could do more. I could do more right now. I could do more today. You know what, something, I, I wasn't going to talk about this today, but I, it just came through my mind. You know something I've started doing? So I, I work eight and a half miles, not my studio. My studio is just up the street from my house. But I have another full-time job which pays the bills. And it's 8.5 miles from my house. And along that way, I either get on or get off. So let's say the 17 miles to go to work and back. I either get on or get off a busy freeway, on-ramp, off-ramp, six times. And who's standing at every one of those off-ramps? People with a sign. Help me. Any any little bit will help. I'm homeless. I have children to feed. I lost my job. So you know what I do? I don't, I don't, I, I, I'm only telling you this because maybe you'll think the same idea. I go to the dollar store and I spend five dollars, five things, something to drink, pack of bandages, deodorant, a candy bar, and they sell Bibles for a buck. And I put those five things in a bag. I keep a couple of them in my back seat. And when I come upon one of those folks, I hand them the bag. I don't think better of myself because I do it. I think better of my Lord, Jesus, who wants me to do it. It doesn't make me a better person. It doesn't make me a good enough Christian. It doesn't make me anything other than a human being walking the same piece of dirt that those guys are. And I can help. I started this conversation today with you with asking you what we could really do to witness to people. What does Jesus really want? There are, there are millions of people right now, but let's just talk about you or somebody you know, family member, friend, neighbor, who has made this comment, I don't know what God wants out of me, or... I don't know what God's will is for my life. Or, I, I, don't, I don't know if I should be telling people about God. God. Sometimes I tell people about God and they, think, they look at me like I'm weird and I'm, I'm, I'm strange and it makes me very uncomfortable. Pause. You know where the feeling of uncomfortable comes from? Yeah, and it isn't God. Play. Whenever I want... Whenever somebody says to me, I don't know what God wants out of my life. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I thought it was to be a mom. 
And now my kids are grown, and I'm, they've, they've all moved away. I don't, I don't get to see the grandkids. I'm not a mom anymore. I mean, I'm a mom, but I'm not a mom. I, I wanted to be a dad. I wanted to raise children. I wanted to raise them right. I wanted to teach them about Jesus. I, I wanted to bring them to the church. I wanted them to become good, upstanding citizens and have families. And I don't know what happened. I guess drugs got in the way. And that one son of mine, he, I don't love him any less, but my gosh, it wasn't what I intended for him. It wasn't my plan for him. I wanted to be a banker, says one person. I, I wanted to be a teacher, says another. I wanted to be a doctor, a lawyer, a nurse. I don't know what God wants for my life. Well, psst, come here. Let me tell you a little secret. It's in the Bible. The book of Matthew. You know Matthew, the tax collector, the one that everybody hated, the one that everybody thought was just such a jerk, thief. How could Jesus choose someone like that to be one of his chosen 12? It's the pit, not the pulpit, remember. Matthew wrote it. Humans put a chapter number on it. And a verse number. But from Matthew's heart, because he heard Jesus say this. See, Matthew was standing there. Jesus was about to ascend to his father. He had just spent days upon days upon weeks after his resurrection with his disciples. Helping them understand what his mission and ministry had been. He didn't come to save Jerusalem. He didn't come to be the king. He didn't come to wage war and win and set his people free. At least not from a religious standpoint. Oh, Jesus came to set people free. Isaiah teaches us in the 61st chapter of his book. In the very first verse. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted and set the who free? The captives. Who are the captives? They're the ones being held by sin. The ones that the devil's got their hook into them. The ones that never thought they'd be good enough following the law. So they just gave up said, God will never want me. I'm not good enough. Jesus came down and said, come here. I'm setting you free. Oh, I didn't come to abolish the law. No, 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 no. The law is very important. My father made those laws, and we're going to stand up, and we're going to do our best to meet them and follow them, teach them. But if you can't, if you don't, if your sinful nature overpowers you, if your lust just wins your heart, if your need for greed and a big house and a fancy car and a fur coat is more important than finding out what God wants you to do with your life and then doing it, Jesus came to set you, the captive, free. Came to set the captives free. And once we are free, all he asks us to do is, here comes that word again. We started out with it at 10 o'clock. If you weren't here at 10 o'clock, let me share the word with you. In Greek, it is many times defined or translated as martyr. Martyr. Died for your cause. Died for your king died for the truth died do you think that's an earthly death yeah sometimes martyrs do I mean that's kind of the, 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 the thing we say oh well you know that guy died for his cause 
I got his, you know, John the Baptist, they took his head off. He died. He was a martyr. But when else do you die? When else do you become a martyr for your king, for your savior? Another Greek word for witness is martyr. Die to self. Surrender your idols. Give up your fancy cars. Or don't. God doesn't care. As long as it's not more important than he is. Remember that works don't get you salvation. It's a free gift that Jesus has already granted you for his death on the cross. And all he asks, all he said to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other witnesses that day in Jerusalem, as he ascended to the Father to sit on the right hand of the Father in the, in the throne room, he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, black, white, yellow, brown, tall, thin, fat, skinny, believers or non-believers, good people or not. Make disciples of all nations and then just baptize them in whose name? It's not your name. You're, you're, you're just tinkling the water. You're just dunking them underneath. The one that's baptizing them, the one that gives them the justification, the glory, the sanctification, the justification, I'm going to say that twice, the justice. God's justice finds you innocent of sin. And he gives you that gift. And because of that gift, he simply asks you to pass it forward. Pass it on. Disciple somebody. You don't need to go on a mission trip to Jamaica or India or Africa or anything like that. And if you do, that's great. I mean, I'm glad you do. You're called to do that. But you can also do it at high V. You can you you can do it walking down the street. You can do it to your neighbor as he's cutting down that limb that fell off of the tree and hit his house. And you can go over and help pick up some of the branches, some of the leaves, some of the everything. And just say, how you doing? Well, I'm, I don't know how I'm doing. I can't believe this happened. Yeah, I thought the same thing. And then, I, to be honest with you, I just thank God that I'm alive. That I'm able to walk across the lawn and help you. That my daughter can call me and say, oh, Dad, we got through it. Somehow we got through it. Your grandson, he's fine. Or, Mom, how'd you do? How'd you get through the storm? Well, we did good, son. Your, your father and I just sat and prayed, and we got through it. Good job, Mom. Good job. Good job. Because that's all you can really do. Just be there for each other. Hurricane winds in Iowa in August. Are, are you kidding me? Nope. Just go be there for him. Make disciples of all men and women across the world, across your neighborhood, across the lawn, maybe just across the street. Bill Heiberg's book, Just Walk Across the Room. Just tell somebody that you're thankful to a guy named Jesus, that your family wasn't hurt, that they weren't hurt, that the house wasn't destroyed. Go and make disciples of all men and women, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what you're called to do. How you do it is up to you. I had a friend of mine. Almost lost everything in his life because of alcohol. But he got sober. 
He got his girl back. His kids back. But then it came time to get his job back. And he was one of those guys who was licensed and confirmed and accredited. And oh my gosh, I don't know if they'll ever give me my license back. And he studied and he studied and he studied. And then one day, you know what? He took the test. He did the best he could. And when he got the mail with the envelope that either would make him joyful or sorrowful, he opened it up and it said, Congratulations, Jim. You've got your license back. So Jim puts his suit on. This, this is a real person I'm talking about. I know this person. This really happened. Jim gets his best suit and tie on, and his shoes are shined, and he looks dapper. And in one week, he interviews at three places. Now, these are the jobs that he wants, because why not start with what you want? Don't start at the bottom of the barrel. Start at the top. Go for the brass ring. He got his license back. He's sober. Go get the best job you can. And if you can't get that one, get the next best. And if they won't take you, then it's the next best. And in one week, in one week, he gets offered one job, mm -mm. two jobs, mm -mm. all three jobs offered him a position in their company and he called me and he's in tears I mean I can just you can just hear his voice cracking and he he, he he's about ready to call the, the woman that's going to be his wife pretty soon and tell her look look at what's look at what we did and then he asked me a question that I will never forget it's not the question that meant so much it's the fact that the moment he asked me, I didn't have an answer. I don't know his field. I don't know who they are. I don't know who's good and bad and ugly and uh, uh. But Jesus laid the answer on my heart, and without me thinking, it came out of my mouth. And I went, oh, thanks, Holy Spirit. I think that was a good answer. Because Jim asked me, what job should I take? Well, I probably should have said, which pays more? No, that's not what I said. Well, which has the nicest boss? Mm, no, no, didn't come to my head. Well, which one do you get the biggest office? That one right over my head, too. Close to home, best security, best 5013C, or not 501, 401K. No. You know what Jesus laid on my heart to tell that man when he asked me I got offered three jobs, which one do I take? Ha. <laughs> And Jesus told me to say to Jim, Jim, God doesn't care. It doesn't matter. As long as you do the one thing, the one thing you're supposed to do for him that he commands you to do, go therefore into the world and make disciples of all men and women, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't care if you pick up garbage. God doesn't care if you're a police officer, a doctor, a lawyer, a radio announcer. See, he even has places for those of us who are pretty dense. <laughs> whether you bake cakes, whether you drive a bus, whether you teach, whether you raise horses, whether you're the best soldier that God ever put on this earth, or father, or mother, or grandmother. God doesn't care what earthly thing you do. What he does care is about one thing, that you go out into the world and you disciple men and women, and you make them Jesus' disciples, their followers. And you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if you're afraid of water, if you think you're going to melt like the wicked witch from the West, then I'll do it. But that's what God has planned for your life. That's his will for you. Amen?
Amen. I love you. Have a great day.